whenever you get into like the sourdough focaccia, we're talking like 72 hours of science. Um, so if you're willing to do it at home, it's more easy to just get a simple, like even just pizza dough recipe. Um, start off with that and then build from there. So that's what we have in front of you is just a simple focaccia start. Um, and then in, on your plates in front of you, you've got some thyme, some rosemary. Um, we've chopped up some tomatoes. There's some onion. There's some chopped bell peppers. If you want more, just raise your hand and we can help you out. Um, one thing you can do, just an idea to start, um, so this is just a simple bouquet. So it's taking your time um, and kind of placing it in a V somewhat to give you different stems. Um, then you can take like the side section of the pepper is really good for like one flower. You can even feel free to tear your pepper um, and just make it the way you want. You can take um, your onion and make another flower or if you're into making little scenes just whatever your imagination takes you um, I did one this morning I used kale and I just made a little lady in the rain um, there's some people who even do um, if anybody knows Van Gogh's Starry Night um, that's one that some <laughs> everyone knows that one um, that's one that some people do too um, which is like a lot of onions and you can sit and play and one thing you can do at home is if you make your room colder or you keep your dough in the fridge until you're ready, it gives you more time before it poofs up and it's ready to go into the oven. So if you guys just want to start, I'll walk around, see what you're doing. You can ask me questions, use your imagination and uh, have fun. <laughs> No, don't put the oil on first. Just do what you'd like. So start decorating it. You can take yours. There I can. Um, so we're going to put the oil after. What it does is it usually you would put it first on like a focaccia, but when you put it after, it'll help protect some of the stuff. It'll change, it's an oven and it's bread and it's food, right? Um, but it helps to protect it a bit more. <laughs> yeah, feel free to rip it. I've even done where like I've taken the little sprigs, like if you're doing like a scene, you can do grass with it. Yeah, what I do is I put it on after because it helps to protect all of that. But yeah. So it'll be important for you to be Beautiful. Yeah. Here, have mine. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome.
So an example of a flower that you can do that's super easy, if you take your thyme sprig and you've got it on your focaccia, you can take um, your tomato quarters or halves and you can line them up to make like, um, I forget what it's called. <laughs> what is the, it's like a bellflower. Um, so you just take your sprig and you've got the tomatoes going up and around. So one thing you can do too, to do more, is you can take your onion halves or onion circles, you can split them up, and you can do if you get, um, let's see, like a piece of thyme or something for the, the center of the flower, you can put that in the middle, and then you can take your onion parts, pieces, um, and you can put them around the circle to make like kid's sun or a sunflower or something like that. Um, it's just a different shape and a different idea. Now you're working with food. It's not going to look perfect.
I see a lot of people doing bouquets. You can also take like a little sprig or something and make like a joiner at the bottom, um, like a tie or something, make it look like it. So it's just like even taking the bottom piece of your time and just placing it across to make it look like a tie. Um, some people doing scenes, you can use uh, the rosemary to make grass. Um, if you peel it off the sprig, it'll come in little bunches like this. Um, you can just place it along the bottom. Your imagination is your limit. Don't feel worried if you're making indents into your dough, too. That's better to catch the olive oil. Yeah. In a, tradi yeah, in a traditional one, you would do it first. This way, if we do the oil last, it helps to cover the ingredients and protect them. It's a little twist on focaccia. A little backwards, forwards. Five minutes. <laughs> Feel free to cut your ingredients any way you want. Whatever you see is what you can do. You can even take your peppers if you're feeling adventurous and try rolling them. So opening it up like this, and then you can try just taking it. It's really hard to do, so if it's not working, don't get upset. Um, and then you just twirl it around the end. And you can get like a little rose that can happen. <laughs> if you push your stuff into the dough a little bit too, like if it's releasing a bit, it'll help hold it. The dough will expand over top. So don't push it too far, but just a little nudge in will help to glue it in. You can even take your pepper too. If it's like this, rip the one third off. You can use a piece of onion even. Sometimes it works easier. And if you do it like that, you can do like a little butterfly. So I've got my onion, like the little butterfly body. I got the wings here. You put it together. It's like a little butterfly. You can do that too. Old school kid seagulls, you can take your onion, break it. And then you've got little birds like kids when they're making their pictures, just the little M's. And then when you're done your design, what you can do is start drizzling olive oil over top. Make sure you try and cover your vegetables because the olive oil will help them to stop burning. Focaccia art is pretty abstract. You just kind of aim for the picture of that you want in your head and hope you get there. If we were using like chives or green onions or the kale that I used on the lady's dress, you would really, really want to coat that in olive oil to help it from shrinking and burning. 
Mm -hmm. Everywhere. Try not to drown it in olive oil, but just a nice, <laughs> a nice coating is good. Yeah, that's perfect. That's beautiful. You should see some of the stuff I made in the beginning. Don't be hard on yourself. You got to start somewhere. It's, it's beautiful. That is better. <laughs> How's everybody doing all right? Pardon? Yep. Yep. So if you're using like just a general, um, I'm gonna go over it with you when I walk through making um, just a general easy bread dough. Um, you can use that, You like I said, just a simple pizza dough. You can go as fancy as a sourdough, 72 hour ferment. Um, this is just regular pizza dough? This is Sal San Marcos focaccia dough. Focaccia. But if you're in a pinch, a pizza dough is a quick, easy way to do it. You can even just go to the store and buy the pre made doughs, um, split that up and do little focaccias or just do a big pan of it. There is a difference. <laughs> yeah. You need more time? Just a couple. Everybody seems pretty good, though. You're putting on your finishing touches. Hello. Test. Oh, my gosh. Everything's looking so amazing. So for those of you here in-house, I, I saw some people writing their names down. You just need to make sure you also write down your table number so that we can very easily find you or else it's going to be like reading Rainbow Lady with like, you know, I see Jessica and where's Jessica, you know, so. And does anybody have any questions for Rebecca? Any questions about... I know we're going to get to the dough. I know the YouTube people, thank you so much. Those watching online, thank you for your patience. We had to do it this way because in person here we are baking the items. And so we needed to get our stuff ready first. But we will absolutely be getting into how to make the dough right after we get all our stuff put away. So stay tuned for that. But does anybody here have any questions at all for Rebecca? No? Okay, well, we'll let you keep going, Rebecca. It's All great. Right. <laughs> you can drizzle it. Um, so just use your spoon, drizzle it like you would. I mean, you're pretty good there. Um, and then <laughs> you can even take the extra if you've got extra on your dough. Just use your hands and you can spread it over top your toppings. Yeah, exactly like that. <laughs> it's beautiful. I like it. Yeah. Floral Mandela. Yeah. <laughs> Don't worry about the puddle. <laughs> it's okay. So I like your butterfly. butterfly. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, I showed my mom, my uh, little old lady in the rain, and she went, oh. And then I showed her, and she oh, I see it now. Yes. Oh, yeah? Do you know the chip ears? The what? The chip ears? Yeah. <laughs> I've been baking for, like, years, and then I just started doing this with COVID. I've got two boys at home. <laughs> Pardon? Would you do it as a, fam as a party thing? Yeah. Yeah. I gotta get you a card or a
beautiful. When you're hungry, you just pull it up. Exactly. <laughs> you just want to eat, eh? <laughs> Me too. I mean, some people get like millions of dollars for just putting a dot on a piece of paper. <laughs> It's a sunset. It's beautiful. <laughs> it's a very beautiful sunset. Looks like they're starting to gather up the focaccias to take them to go bake. Okay. I think they're ready for that. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, what I have here, you can take notes if you want. I don't mind if this recipe is stolen. You can't really steal a public recipe. <laughs> so, one thing that I said that you can do is you can use a pizza dough for your focaccia. The difference between a pizza dough and a focaccia dough is generally the amount of yeast that's used. So a focaccia dough, you're going to use more yeast to give it more rise and more fluffiness. Um, I honestly find even just using a pizza dough, a lot of people, unless you're making like a muffaletta sandwich where you would cut it in half or another bread that you would cut in half, um, if you're looking to do fancy things like that. But if you're just going somewhere quick, um, want to bring something fancy, do a simple design, a lot of people won't know the difference. If you use some nice fancy finishing salt, put some garlic, make it good. Um, one thing I like to say is when you're thinking of your design, try and keep it an idea of the flavor that you want because some things are gonna look pretty together, but when you cut into it and go to eat it, it's not gonna taste so great. Um, with decorating, your imagination is your limit. YouTube is great for learning. Um, what I generally use is just a little paring knife for cutting other than like breaking down the bigger vegetables when I get into like the little things, the nice little curved paring knife um, is great whenever you get into um, skinning a radish or anything like that. I can cut it nice and thin and I'll go over that after, back to the dough. I kind of got into this because I have ADD out the front door, and if anybody has that too, it's like, I can see one <laughs> lady's laughing. Um, it's kind of like squirrel brain. Um, and with doing the art and the focaccia, it's something where I can kind of pull and think and relax and kind of calm down and focus on what I'm doing. Um, but yeah, so if I go off on a tangent, you can let me know. I'm like, hey, go back to <laughs> telling us how to make your dough. So, does anybody do sourdough? One, two, two. Yeah. 
too. Okay, so I'll stick to the yeast side. Um, but you hate sourdough? Oh, you eat it. I, I do too, a lot. Um, all right, so when you go to the grocery store, there's going to be on the shelf a whole ton of yeast. The packets are great if you're just doing the odd dough here and there because you don't have to worry about buying the big jar, writing the date on it, making sure that like the yeast is always alive and it's always kept cold. Um, and then generally too, the little packets are generally measured out to a simple dough recipe where you generally use about two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast. Um, one thing I always say too, even if you just bought the yeast like five minutes ago, check and make sure that it's alive because the amount of times that I've bought dead yeast and because I've checked it, I haven't ruined the whole dough. So to check your yeast, what you do is so for this recipe, it's one and a half cups of warm water. You don't want hot water because yeast is alive. I like to call my yeast my little pet. I make sourdough. It's Sally the starter. Um, <laughs> that way, too, my husband opens the fridge and he sees Sally sitting there and not like this glump of flour that he's like, oh, that's garbage. No, it's Sally. You don't throw Sally out. Um, so getting back to the dough with your yeast, you're going to check with warm water. A lot of recipes say like, oh, 110 to 115 degrees. If it's burning the back of your hand or the softest part of your skin, it's too hot. Um, you want it like a nice warm bath. You want to be able to put your hand in and hold it there for a few seconds um, because if it's too hot, it's going to kill your yeast. Um, yeast also really likes sugar. Um, so with people or... Before I go, no. Yeast really likes sugar. It likes to eat sugar. Um, so that's another thing. Whenever you check your yeast, the part of the recipe that has sugar, you can subtract from it, or you can just use all the sugar. So with this recipe that I use just at home, it's my quick grab, takes no thinking. Um, it's one and a half cups of warm water to two and a quarter teaspoons. So like I said, you can just go in the store, buy that packet. There's two and a quarter teaspoons in there. You don't even have to measure it. To two and a quarter teaspoons of yeast with two tablespoons of sugar. I always add sugar even if it doesn't ask for it because it gives you a nice soft bread. Um, when you go to the bakeries and you're buying those really, really light loaves of homemade bread, there's generally a ton of sugar in there to help it to lighten up. Um, if you have one of these KitchenAid things, awesome. It's like my best friend. Um, my husband bought it for me like seven years ago and I said, why'd you get me that? I do everything by hand. I brought it out and I started using it and I haven't gone back. Um, kneading dough by hand is just not my time anymore. Um, but if you want great arm muscles, knead your dough by hand. So water first. A lot of the time if you add your water after you've added your yeast and sugar, sometimes it spills out and well, what did I lose? Did I lose a teaspoon? Did I lose a quarter teaspoon? Sometimes it looks like you lost more than what you actually did. Um, so then you can take your sugar and your yeast, add them in. Give it a little stir. And then what you do, if I was at home and actually like had more time, what I would do is wait about 10 minutes. Um, and what you'll see, if your yeast is alive, you'll start to eventually see little bubbles. So it's going to settle on the bottom and eventually little bubbles will start to rise to the top. Don't use it yet. Wait until there's about, it's, it's like a little foam that forms on the top. That's when you'll start adding your flour and everything else because then you know your yeast is alive. If after 10 minutes there's nothing happening, you got dead yeast, try another packet or go buy more yeast. Um, it's really annoying when your yeast dies and you're in a pinch, um, which is why I like to have a little bit more, but if you're just doing it every once in a while, what's running to the grocery store? Um, so you would wait for a minute, let it 
bubble up and do its thing. It's already kind of starting here. Um, you can also use like an instant yeast. Read your instructions, make sure you know what you're buying. Um, some recipes are made specifically for instant yeast. Some recipes are made for a live yeast. Some recipes are made for this other yeast. Um, so make sure you're buying what it asks for. Um, so we've mixed that. It's starting to bubble already. Um, so we've got our sugar in there, our yeast is eating it, making lots of carbon monoxide or carbon dioxide bubbles. And then we've got our sugar. And then what I do is I add oil. So two tablespoons of oil into this. And it's going to help the dough again to be super soft and pliable. I generally measure with love and my eyeballs. When you start making bread, if this is like brand new, take your time, don't rush it. If it overproofs, it overproofs. It's still edible at the end of the day. Um, I've thought, oh, this is a warm spot. I'll put my bread there, it'll rise fast. Then I've forgotten about it and it's like this giant mess. You can fix it, like it's carbs at the end of the day. Just slap some butter on it <laughs> and eat it. Um, so, Then what you're going to do is you're going to start adding your flour. So for this recipe, this general easy one, it's three and a half cups to three and a quarter cups. I aim for the low end as it's mixing. Now this is where using a KitchenAid is really nice because you can see it mix. You're not using your hands. You're not full of dough going, oh, when's it going to come together? And little did you know that in two more throws of kneading it, it would have come together and you accidentally added more flour. So then now you've got this lump that's not pliable and we got to add more water. So again, as expensive as these are, if you're going to do it, it's worth it. I mean, if you're making pies or anything else, it's so nice, even cookies, just to throw it in. Um, but so we're going to add three and a half cups flour. So at three cups, I start mixing it. Start on your lowest setting if you're using this. If you start too high, flour is going to fly everywhere. Ask me how I know. We have a big mixer at work. That's like a big giant mixer. We've had some flour explosions with new employees. So you can make it go a bit faster. If you're at home, use a wooden spoon and a bowl. Give her a good mix. You don't want to plop it out on your table before it's gotten a good mix because then you're just spending more time kneading than you really need to and your shoulders will really hurt the next day. So what you're doing when you're kneading is you're building the gluten in your bread. And the gluten is going to help to form and string the bread together. Um, well, I don't add the salt in. I completely forgot the salt, but let's pretend I have some salt. I don't normally add the salt in until about now with this recipe because your salt also helps to build gluten. So if you add it while you're mixing as opposed to when it's sitting with the yeast, it's going to help you a little bit more in my experience. Um, if you talk to other bakers, everyone has their own idea of how to do things. Like, you could get a clone of me up that's been doing the same thing for years, but has little different techniques and tricks. It's really nice to talk to people. If you have a local bakery that you go into, I mean, from my experience being from, I mean, it may help that I'm in a small town. Um, they don't mind talking and helping you. And if you're interested in starting sourdough even, to make a sourdough focaccia, which is really nice and fancy. Um, bakeries, we have so much sourdough starter that we don't mind giving you a little teaspoon or a tablespoon to try it. Um, so don't feel scared to go into your local bakery and say, hey, like, can I have a little bit of sourdough starter to try? I mean, what's the worst they're gonna say? No, go try another one. Um, so basically, when you're kneading, you're kneading to get to window pane. 
So even right now, the reason why I start with less flour than what the recipe calls for is because, again, being bread, humidity, the room, all sorts of different factors can add to the moisture that's in the flour and everything else already. So I've only done three cups, and it's almost to where I need it to be. So when you're mixing it, you want it to start pulling off the bowl. If you're using one of these, it's going to start pulling cleanly off the bowl. Um, I'm going to give it a couple seconds and you'll see, or actually what I can do. So this is just before it's done. So you can see it's kind of still sticking. It's kind of stuck to the bowl. It's not ready at all. Um, but that is where you could, if you were using a wooden spoon and a bowl and kneading it with your... Uh, great powerful arms, that's when you could pull it out and start it on the table and raise your bowl. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start adding flour slowly and give it time to mix in. Um, again, the slower the, well not really the slower the better, but if you take your time, don't just like dump it in because then you're playing science in your head to try and get something that you can use a bit better. Anybody have any questions so far? Am I going too fast? Yeah? What kind of oil? Olive oil. I like to stick to olive oil. Oh, what kind of, she asked what kind of oil I added in. I like to use olive oil. It's got a nice taste. Um, you could use what you're comfortable with if you're comfortable with like an avocado oil. I personally haven't used it. Um, you basically need a fat. Um, what I really actually like cooking with is lard. Um, I've gone back to my grandma's kitchen and I'm rendering lard and it helps working at a butcher shop <laughs> um, that it's always around. But I find even lard gives, if you're making a typical loaf of bread, lard gives a really nice flavor. Um, if I know that I'm doing a bacon fry up the next morning and I happen to be making bread, I'll use a bacon fat in my bread and it gives it a bit more of a bacon flavor. Um, if not, I'm generally using a beef tallow. Um, that's really nice too because if it gets on your hands, it's natural. It's the best skin moisturizer you'll ever use. So this is coming too. I wish you all could just see over my head. So you see how my bowl's a bit cleaner. It's becoming more of a formed dough. Um, that's the gluten building up and it's starting to stick together. And then we're gonna mix it to about window pane, which generally takes about 10 minutes. So if anybody's got any questions, it's gonna take a yes. Testing. Okay, there we go. What does window pane mean? Window pane? <laughs> you got ahead of me. Um, so window pane is what I check to make sure I'm done kneading my bread. Um, don't overshoot your window pane. So I'm going to show you in a minute, a few minutes once it's ready if I can. Um, so basically what you're going to do is you're going to take a golf ball sized amount of your bread, dough, and you're going to start to stretch it out with your fingers. So if you've Imagine me with a little dough ball in my hands. I'm going to start to stretch it out. And I want it to stretch out into a nice, clean um, layer, like paint. Um, and I want to see through it. And if it's breaking before, it's not ready. But if it stretches out into like a nice saran wrap consistency, and I can see if I put my finger behind it, and I can see the shadow of my finger through it without ripping the dough, that's window pane. Um, it's going to be easier if I can get the dough in time to show you. Does it kind of make sense? Yeah? Hey. For window pane, is it only for, for focaccia or no. any dough? Any dough. Yeah. Any dough. Um, so it just lets you know again that your gluten's built, it's there, it's least likely to fail <laughs> if you hit window pane. Um, it's really hard to over knead a dough. 
you got to be kneading for a really long time before it's over kneaded. It's easier to under knead. Um, so as long as you remember in your head window pane so that you can stretch it out enough that it doesn't break or rip and that if you can flip your finger behind or if you can see the light through it, you're good. Yep. Can you over knead it? It's really hard to over knead, like <laughs> really hard to over knead. Um, like I just said, you can very easily under knead it. So if you see I've got my dough, I've stretched it out. It's starting to break. It's not ready yet. I can't get that window pane to hold. So we need a few more minutes. And you don't need a big amount, just a small amount that you can spread it out. We have another question. Yep. So when it's not ready, you put it back and you keep kneading it, but you don't add anything to it? Nope. No. And what if it's too sticky? I've often... If it's too sticky, like if it's sticking to like everything, it's then it's not ready to be kneaded yet. Um, so as you're mixing it, you want it to start coming off your bowl. So if you think of like... But what do you do to get it off your bowl? Like you got to mix it and build that gluten. <laughs> so not add anything, stick the same ingredients, but like keep mixing them? So if you started your recipe and it says three and a quarter to three and a half cups and you've gone to three and a quarter and it's just not coming together, go to the three and a half. Okay. I wouldn't go over because then you're adding more flour in and you're getting a different dough. Um, so then what you do is once you've hit that three and a half cups at the top of the recipe, you mix and you mix and you mix. And sometimes you're mixing for a lot less time than what you actually should be doing. Um, I find a lot of recipes that when they say a need for 10 minutes, it needs that 10 minutes. Um, it's also something that as you do it more, you'll get to see. So that first bread you make, it's probably yeah, no, I gonna. Threw it completely out. But yeah. <laughs> but, but you don't add liquid for it to help the flour. No. No, the liquid, the, the liquid's gonna make it fall apart more. Okay. Um, the or problem when you is... add too much flour is okay. then you're getting that brick, right? You gotta find that finesse in the middle. Um, and as you do it more you'll get more of a hand on it. Don't be scared about how many times you've thrown out bread. Like, I've thrown out kilos upon kilos of bread. I had a market one time and we threw out five kilos because it just didn't come together right. Somebody made a mistake and off you went and we started again. Um, but that's where, like, where you were asking if you add more or add less. Yeah, so you I just kept gotta... experimenting what to add. But with the, with the KitchenAid, I find that the flour keeps at the very center bottom. Okay. And even with a wooden spoon, it doesn't go into the dough. It gets so try adding a little bit more. Um, of flour? One thing you can do, too, is find a recipe that goes by weight. <laughs> Scales are 12 bucks at Canadian Tire. It is the best investment ever because then you'll start nailing your dough. The problem, like, using a cup and a tablespoon and a cup and a tablespoon, if I'm talking to a bunch of people who aren't baking all the time, it's easy for you to picture one cup. Yeah. Um, at work, when I make, I have two different kinds of bread. When I'm weighing them out, they're 140 grams for each bun. The bun for my Vienna is very light. You wouldn't know that there's 140 grams in there. It's nice, it's light, and it's big. The Portuguese bun that I make at work is like this big, heavy honking ball that you would think is 200 and some grams versus the 140. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is you can be thrown off by measurements if you're using a cup because my idea of a cup versus your idea of a cup, well, maybe you're using this much and I'm using that much. If we get into weights, 200 grams is 200 grams, 600 grams is 600 grams. Then two, you can start looking like, okay, my humidity today is very high. 
I'm going to reduce the percentage of humidity into my dough. Um, which then is getting into like the air quality and everything like that. Um, I know some bakers that go down to the point of they write out the weather for the day. Oh, yeah. And when I made this on this kind of day, the weather affected it, and it does. Um, at work with our sourdough, we do 100% hydration starter through the winter. And it's the same with our bread. We really watch the hydration, but we'll do like 100% hydration in the winter because it's so dry. That starter needs the extra um, moisture in there. But in the summer, where there's a ton of humidity in the air, we're using an 80% starter. Um, so, I mean, you, you could look at it all the way into the weather, but I would start, find yourself a simple recipe by weight. Weight looks super challenging. I don't know what it is versus the cups and the grams, but if you just get a scale, Always remember to zero out your bowl. Your bowl weighs something. <laughs> um, I've even done it where I've been like, ah, I'll throw this Tupperware on. No, that Tupperware is like 14 grams, um, which at the end of the day can change your weights and how it's going to affect the dough. Does that kind of answer yeah. it in a roundabout, in and out no, way? Good, but for somebody who doesn't bake and baked once and failed and I don't want to try it again. Can you share a simple recipe for beginners that we can go home and try to see? This one. If, with the weight, yeah. So with the weight. This one. This one's really this, hard this to one? fail. Oh, okay. Um, even if it comes out a little bit moister and stickier, it's still going to rise into like a little crust for you. Um, it's the one that I make with my kids. I don't know if anyone's ever cooked with a three-year-old or a five-year-old. They are like little mess bombs. They don't really screw it up. Um, and there's been times where I'm like, oh, how much flour did you put in there? We're just going to add a little bit more water to make it look good. Um, and it's still edible. It's still good. Um, if you're in a pinch and you think it failed, spread it out. Throw chopped garlic over top and some finishing salt and some herbs, and you've got garlic bread. And we'll try and let you know. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions at all while I wait for more window pane here? Your bread's also going to start to smooth out as it needs into a correct consistency. You'll see that the outside of it is getting smoother and it's not like this wrinkly, ripply. If you took saran wrap and crinkled it up, it's not going to look like that. It's going to start to smooth out. And for the kitchen egg question, I can show you right now. It's still kind of stuck to the bottom, but it pulls off clean. So that's the key to it. It's got to pull off clean. If you're pulling it off and it's still like just clumps and chunks everywhere, keep going. Um, but like I said, it's still stuck, but it's pulling off nice and clean. You don't use your dough hook over two. I do sometimes. I'm really bad. You get used to doing something, you just keep doing it. Um, but if you stick to two and one, like speed two and one, you're really good. So I'm going to check for that window pane. I got a bigger glob this time, but it doesn't really matter. So I can stretch it pretty far. I made that hole in the middle. But if you see, I don't know how I can get people. I can try and walk around with it. But can you see like my thumb shadow behind it? So that's window pane. It's my window panes falling apart here. So I stretch it. And then you can see the shadow of my finger behind it. Can you see the shadow? You can see the shadow? For, <laughs> for you with the KitchenAid. <laughs> so you see how it pulls? Yeah, this is still, like, it's still kind of sticking to my fingers. Did you answer the question she was saying about where the, the flour gets stuck in the mm -hmm. So it was still stuck whenever I held it up. You just got to keep going. KitchenAids are like famous for getting stuck. So I'm always just like 
making sure that when it goes up the top of the sides, I'm pushing it down a bit, um, scooping it up from the bottom. Don't get discouraged. Keep trying. Like I said, at the end of the day, if it's just like a flop, put it on a pan, put some garlic on top and some salt, then it's fine. It's just a flatbread. <laughs> You're welcome. All right, so your focaccias are starting to come out. The first bake. We have another question over here. Yep. How much salt did you, oh, oh. <laughs> how, mu how much salt do you put in? In this recipe, in the dough, okay. I used two, tab two teaspoons, two teaspoons. Um, but your recipe, follow the recipe for the salt. Um, I mean, I put finishing salt on top after okay. because I really like that nice finishing salt taste. Okay. Um, but follow the recipe because your salt can build okay. too much gluten or add too much of this and too much of that. That's one thing that when I'm doing the recipe, I stick to the salt. Okay. And will the Salsa Marco or you be sharing the recipe online somewhere? We can. Yeah, I can give it to the organizers and oh. they can post Perfect. the recipe. Oh. Yeah. Thank I got a nod. They'll post it. <laughs> Thank you. What's finishing salt? <laughs> it's really good salt. Um, I can't give you like an exact scientific answer, but you've got like your kosher cooking salt, your iodine salt, a finishing salt, a nice mald maldon is the company that we use at work. And it's just like a nicer, coarser salt. Um, one thing that we put like this here. Maldon. Excuse my valley French. Yeah, so okay, yes. nice big salt yes. there. It's really good on chocolate chip cookies. Yeah, it gives a nice taste, a nice chunk of salt. Yeah, you're not going to cook with it. It's not like a kosher salt that you're going to add it into the recipe or something like that. It's just a nice finishing touch on top. Don't go too heavy with it because you'll take a bite and whoa, that's salt. Um, but it's nice to put on top of like a flatbread or a focaccia, especially if you're doing just like a simple garlic and rosemary focaccia, put that finishing salt on top and it just... <laughs> Hi, so Hi. we have a question from YouTube. Is wanting to know about the temperature of the oven and how long to bake it. Um, if you've got like a convection oven, I would do around 450, 475, because your convection is automatically going to drop it and it circulates the air. Um, general rule, 450, 425, put it in, watch it. So you're going to wait about 10 minutes, it'll bubble up, and then you're watching for that perfect golden brown. It'll burn quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so that time that you pull it out when it's got like that nice pizza crust brown on top, if that makes sense, like nothing super dark, um, but like a nice gentle crust on top. If you're doing more of a traditional focaccia, um, where you're doing the larger amount of yeast and you really want that soft, high spongy bread, you're gonna cook it lower at a 400. Um, and then you're gonna cook it for a little bit longer so then it has more time to rise and it's gonna be less of a crust on it. I find if you just do a simple 425, 450 for about 12 minutes or so, most people are happy with that. And any particular rack? Any particular rack. Um, the I'm middle. not a baker, actually, so. <laughs> oh, the, the middle, middle of the I oven. put everything on the middle. <laughs> the middle, um, you don't want to go to the top, you don't want to go to the bottom. The middle yeah. is a nice. Okay. Um, if you know that you have a hot spot in your oven, like some people know if I stick it on this side of my oven, it's going to burn automatically. Don't put it on that side of the oven. Like, give it some time. You don't want it to cook super fast. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi. <laughs> Um, I don't have a pizza stone. I have done it just straight in a cast iron on the barbecue. A cast iron would be similar where you're going to put it in, it's going to get hot and it's going to hold the heat. Um, I just generally, 
I've got a lot of animals. I've got kids and I got a husband. For me, quick and easy is the best. Uh, for a lot of people learning that quick and easy is the best. Honestly, I you can go buy fancy um, sheets. I buy them at the dollar store for four bucks. If they get ruined, I throw them out. They're a nice, easy sheet. They fit most ovens. That's what I use. Um, but if you're getting into the pizza, yeah, the pizza stone will work. Um, again, just watch it. If you're using the preheated pizza stone or the preheated cast iron, it's going to form more of a crust on the bottom because you're putting it from cold to hot. Um, so if you're using like a pan like this, you're not going to get that crazy crust on the bottom as you would with like if you think when you use a pizza stone, that bottom of your pizza is nice and crisp. Um, that's what's going to happen with that. Does that answer your question? Yeah. I personally haven't, just I don't have a stone. Um, but cast iron, yeah, I've done it in the cast iron and it works. Pardon? Oh, <laughs> You must be Italian. You're talking with your hands. Oh, you're French. <laughs> it's close enough. <laughs> Any other questions at all? I think they're bringing out more of your focaccia. So when you get window pane with your dough, back to the dough. When you get your window pane, if you're in a rush, you could split your dough now. It doesn't really make a difference if you split it at the first or the second rise. Um, I generally, what I'll do is I'll use um, a kitchen towel, put it over top. I put a little bit of olive oil over the top of the dough just to help keep it moist. If you find your house is really dry, just saran wrap it. Or if you're putting it in the fridge for a long bulk rise, saran wrap it because your fridge is going to take out all that moisture out of your nice dough. A kitchen towel is not going to cut it in the fridge. You have to use saran wrap and lock in that moisture. Um, so what you would do, if I was at home, I would sit this on the counter or somewhere warm if I wanted to speed it up a bit. Be careful with putting it in warm areas because sometimes it'll go way faster than you thought and you'll come back to your dough is over, you're the sides of your bowl. It's savable. Put it back in. Just do your second rise, split it, put it in your area. Um, but a second, a first rise, you're gonna wait for your dough to double. Um, so it's gonna go from this big to about this big. Generally takes with this recipe about an hour and a half in your average room. Um, then what I would do is I, a lot of the time, have my focaccia and these are a simple, um, I can't think of the measurements, it's not sitting in my head, but a nine by blank pan. <laughs> 18, thank you. Um, pan, I would put some olive oil down on the bottom for making focaccia. I would split my dough. This is where, if you have a scale, comes in so handy because you can think you split this perfectly and then it bulk rises the second time. You're like, wow, that is really small and that is really big um, because it's going to spread out too. So if you had a scale, pop it on the scale, divide it in two. Um, the recipe that I'm giving you makes two or just one really big one. Um, so I would split it in two. Let's pretend I have a scale. I put them in their pans. I try when I put them in the pans to give them a little bit of a nudge out. Um, then we saran wrap it and then it goes for its second rise. Um, again, you can do it in the fridge overnight, have it in the morning for like a breakfast focaccia. You can crack eggs over top. I've got chickens at home. Um, I'll do breakfast focaccias. Oh, <laughs> there's a question. We have another question over here. I told you I don't know anything about baking. So I've seen people where they put dough in a bowl and then put like a um, towel over top. Yeah. So what's the difference between doing that and the wrapping it with saran wrap? And then also what's the difference between leaving it out and putting it in the refrigerator? <laughs> so the refrigerator, the, leaving it out and putting it in a fridge, the refrigerator is gonna slow down 
the yeast activity and the rise. So if you want like a bulk fermentation in the fridge, what's going to happen is your yeast is going to slow down and it's going to start to ferment in that dough, um, which gets into like the sourdough area of things. Um, it also helps our traditional focaccia to rise a little bit more and be a little bit lighter um, because when you're getting into these bulk fermentations, we could get into like the crazy sciences of it, but basically it's breaking down the bread a little bit, which is why people, if you have an issue with gluten, but you're not a celiac, a lot of the time a sourdough is okay for you to eat. It's gluten friendly um, because it's been fermented and broken down a bit. Um, now with the kitchen towel versus the saran wrap, if you have a really dry house or it's in the winter, saran wrap it. It's gonna lock in the moisture. The kitchen towel lets air flow through. So if you're doing a long fermentation in the fridge, the fridge is gonna suck all that moisture out of your dough. Um, if you just use a towel, if you put the saran wrap over top, it locks it in there. Um, so the dough gets to keep it, if that makes a little bit more sense. Yeah. yeah. So would you ever just leave the dough on your counter? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like so if I was doing this this afternoon, I would make up my dough throw a towel over top because I know it rises pretty fast in my kitchen. I'm not worried because it's the summer and it's very humid outside about that humidity lost. In the winter, I have a really old house. Um, I get a lot of wind off the river. My house has like zero humidity. So in the winter, even though it's on my counter, I'm saran wrapping it because I don't want that moisture loss. If we lose moisture, we're not gonna have a nice dough at the end. Okay, so it sounds like it really, a lot of the techniques depend on your actual house and level of humidity and yeah. time of year and if it's raining outside, <laughs> yeah, et cetera, which is, et cetera. Why, <laughs> which is why some bakers I know go as far, like they're really into it, they go as far as writing down the weather, what was it like today, because that will, if you're just a regular Joe in the kitchen, it's not going to matter too much to you if you use a kitchen towel versus a saran wrap. But also it sounds like don't give up if the don't first time you made it, it didn't go well because there's probably five factors at least that yeah. were why it didn't go well. Yeah, it's okay. like I do a lot of cooking. I open the fridge or I see what's in my garden and I throw it together and my husband goes, oh, that was so good. What'd you do? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so if you're maybe trying like something that like um, the lady beside you where she's tried a recipe and she knows it failed that one time, maybe write down what you did. And then next time you go at it, okay, well I did that, maybe I'm gonna try X, Y, Z different this time. And then after you do that again, okay, well it turned out a little bit better, what did I do that was different? And then you can add that into your making of other doughs too. It sounds really complicated and it sounds scary, but it's, once you get into it and doing it, it's not. Um, it's an old skill that a lot of people lost. Yeah, it just sounds like there's a lot of trial and error and people have to be patient. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, nobody saw our ancestors years ago failing and then just making flat bread with garlic on top because, well, that's what came out and we can't not eat it. Was there, sorry, I, I cut you off. Was there more you wanted to talk about in terms of the dough process? Uh, that's basically it. You um, separate it into your two pans, and then you can start your focaccia process. So with a traditional focaccia, before you go to make all your designs and stuff on top, you're going to put your fingers in. Don't push it all the way to the bottom, because then you're flattening all that air out of your dough. Just nice little indents, and then you drizzle your oil, and then you'll just like sprinkle a garlic or something on top, your herbs. Um, then you bake it and then you finish it with a finishing salt or whatever you want at the end. The reason why when I'm doing the designs I put the oil on last is to save your design on top because if we don't put a layer of oil, it's gonna really burn and crisp in the oven, especially if you use something really thin. Um, and again, it's trial and error. I mean, it took me a lot of ugly focaccias to make a nice one. So, I mean, nobody saw me in my kitchen in 2020 going, how do they do this and YouTubing and figuring it out? And I've just built from there. Um, again, I've got ADD, so I hyper-focus on little things and I kind of build it. But 
I mean, it's stuck with me and I like it because I can make it something different every time. It's not always going to be the same. Um, so again, with young kids, I can just throw what they like on it, on a quarter of it, and they'll eat it. And then I can make the rest the way my husband and I and all our guests want it. Um, it's very personable and that you can make it for yourself or what you want. Your imagination is your limit. Um, I work at a butcher deli. I even go into the deli case sometimes and I'll get like a prosciutto and I'll start rolling prosciutto into little prosciutto flowers. Or if you get um, a simple soprasada, but not, you can get them like the thicker ones if you get just a round. To make a meat rose, all you do is you take that round circle, you cut halfway down into the middle, and then you've got like the kid's cone hat, and you can start twirling it around your finger to make a little cone. Um, and again, that's simple. There is so much on YouTube that you can learn. Um, there's people who are literally just sitting there filming videos of different ways that they can cut their vegetables. Um, I've even taken like radishes or cucumbers and you can cut them with little angles through them and then you pull them apart and it comes out like a little rose. And that's something too that you could face up on your bread if you wanted. I think you guys are just waiting for your focaccias. <laughs> Everyone else has theirs. Everyone pretty happy if they've got theirs, how it's turned out so far, yeah? You're so proud of yourself. You did it, not me. I didn't do anything. <laughs> Start your own business now. <laughs> you should be. You don't want to eat it. <laughs> Isn't it nice? Um, a day or so, um, your design as to how it's going to hold up. It's, it's a bread that's better eaten right there. I mean, I don't need an excuse to eat a whole focaccia. It's not very hard to do. <laughs> um, one thing I like doing too is there's a lot of really nice, I believe there's one in the area. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I mean, I this is the big city for me. Um, you can get really nice olive oils and balsamic vinegars. And that's something too where like your focaccia doesn't have to be a dinner or a lunch. You could make a dessert focaccia. Um, you could get like a blood orange olive oil and use that and drizzle Nutella over the top and make like a dessert focaccia. Um, Again, like some people don't really like the Nutella and the bread and stuff like that, but I mean, if you're making something neat and different, why not try it? Um, you could get into candied fruits and stuff and put that over top too. Um, again, your imagination is where you stop yourself. Try it, and if it didn't work, try something different next time. It is a blank canvas. It is. It's your canvas. Figure out what you want, have an idea, and go. Um, one thing that I like to do if I'm getting into like more intricate designs and fancier designs is I'll get a piece of par parchment. I have my dough in the fridge so it doesn't overproof on me because I like to sit there and nitpick and move this one two millimeters this way and move this one two millimeters that way. And my husband goes in and says, stop, it's fine. Um, do your design on parchment first. Figure out like how about 
big your dough is going to be, do it on the parchment and then lay it out. That way when you get your dough out of the fridge or when it's ready and ready to go, you're ready to go then too. Um, when I'm scoring crazy sourdough designs into bread, I have my bread in the fridge so it sits and it holds together a little bit longer and I've got my design drawn out so I can kind of figure out how I'm going to do it. The better you prep yourself, the better it's going to turn out. Where I work, no, we don't do this. <laughs> um, I have my own little business. Um, it's called Between Ditches. I do it for fun. Uh, <laughs> Between Ditches. Uh, <laughs> I grew up in the valley, if I haven't told you already. Um, there's a lot of really funny sayings out there. <laughs> Keeper between the ditches is one of them. Um, it's basically just keep yourself on the road, keep your vehicle on the road, the ditches, the rhubarb, keep out of the rhubarb, the rhubarb's the bush, don't drive off the road. Um, I had kids before COVID and then COVID hit and I was already playing and have, having fun. Um, I'm like an introverted extrovert where I really relied, being a stay-at-home mom with my animals and everything that I have to do at home, I really relied on being able to go out and go to mom groups and have the play groups and just keep my brain off of what I had to do at home. Um, and then COVID hit and all that stopped. So then I had to slowly figure out as my mentality was crushing because here I was at home with the responsibilities of home. My husband worked out at home. I got two young kids who were basically two toddlers at the time, nobody to talk to. I started the between the ditches to keep my mind between the ditches. Um, so that's kind of where that name kind of fit in. I do this on the side. It's what I do for fun. So I'll do the focaccias, if you guys have parties and you want me to come, um, I can figure that out too and how to teach you guys like a, like a paint night, but we're gonna make carbs and eat them because that's <laughs> way, way better. Um, but like I've done little designs, um, like I do woodworking too. Like again, I've got the brain of a squirrel. Um, so whatever I see at the time, I'm very artistic, so whatever I see, I try it out, and if it works, I may not be doing it at the moment, but you can always message me and say, hey, I really liked what you did six months ago, can you do that for me? Well, yeah, I've still got the skills. Um, I do a bunch of canning, I do a bunch of gardening, I sell my garden goods, I've got chickens and quail at home, I sell their eggs. Um, the only problem with that is because they're on my property, you got to come all the way out to the country to get them um, because I really can't be taking them off property and selling them. So if you're ever in the Renfrew County area, message between ditches and I've probably got eggs for you to buy if you want. Um, and those would be great on a breakfast focaccia if you start your dough in the evening, put it in the fridge to sit until you're ready for that stretch and bake. You can stretch it, get it all covered in olive oil, crack some eggs over top, and then everyone gets a slice of their bread with the egg already there. You can crumble cheese over top. You could do bacon or tofu, yes. It's me again. Um, <laughs> so I know that this is mostly focused on focaccia and bread. And by the way, oh my God, <laughs> this bread is amazing. Is this the recipe that we're gonna share with everybody? No, this is the Sal San Marco. Um, <laughs> just basically, like I said, there's more yeast in it. They're not gonna give you their recipe because right. that's like Sal San okay. Marcos. Um, you can go on the internet well, you, sure. gave it, you said you, well, we're going to share. Well, you're going to get mine. Share mine's the, your not recipe. like the traditional crazy Sal San Marco. This is something easy. It's really hard Kay. to screw up. Yeah. Um, if you do screw it up, don't be hard on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> try we, again. We already, we already went over the, you have to try it a million <laughs> times to make it good. <laughs> um, but if you wanted to find something similar, you're going to Google online traditional sourdough or traditional focaccia, sorry. Okay. Make sure it's fermented for 72 hours. So that means you don't touch it okay, so for a long time. For those of us who don't understand build. what that means. 
It's gonna sit. Are we making the dough? Yeah, you and make the dough and then it sits and you don't touch sit, it for It sits in my hours. fridge for three days. Well, basically, it can. Covered yeah. in saran wrap. Yeah. Okay. You can go that far. You can do a 24-hour. It's going to give you a different bread at the end of the day. Um, okay. It's something where, like, you could even take this one, sit it in the fridge for a day and see what happens. Like the one that you have at the front of the room? Yeah. People could take chunks of it if they want? Yeah, you could let it sit in the fridge for a day or two, <laughs> see what happens, build it up. It's just going to give you a different bread. Okay, cool. So I have a question not quite related to bread, but for baking in general. Um, when I've tried to bake cookies, that doesn't really work either. Okay. Do you have... <laughs> and, and some other friends who won't be named. Um, <laughs> So just wondering if you have any general tips about baking cookies and what might be going wrong. <laughs> um, if you use too much flour, it goes wrong really quickly. If you use too little flour, it's not really going to screw up. You're just going to end up with like a greasy cookie. Um, don't over mix your cookie batter. It's the um. same with muffin batter. If you overmix it, you'll notice it becomes this dense, firm muffin. If you overmix a muffin, and it's kind of the same with a cookie. If you overmix it, mm -hmm. it just becomes this dense mass. So, and are you mixing it in your stand mixer or with a wooden spoon? I would say start making cookies by a spoon in your hands first, okay. and then move to the mixer because this is going to act differently and be very easy to overmix. When I'm making cookies, generally, like if I'm making a small batch or if I'm making muffins or something like that, I do it by hand with a spoon. Okay. I don't use this because this will easily overmix a cookie or a muffin and give you that thick, hard paper rock. Weight. <laughs> okay, that paper weight. So, so the dough we can mix all day long and it will be fine. Yeah. And the cookie stuff, you want to just mix just it just until just until everything is all kind of and then stop okay don't go past that like check the bottom of your bowl because a lot of the time flour will hide out in the bottom of your bowl um whenever you're mixing it be sure my mom and my grandma <laughs> drilled this into me whenever you mix go around and down and then up because then you're getting everything at the bottom and pulling it up to mix in if you're just doing like this mm. you're just getting the top and nothing's mixing at the bottom so really make sure you scrape those sides go down bring it up and then it's kind of like folding it make sense what about weighing for, for the cookies and the, that sort of thing? Do you also recommend recipes that have things by weight or are yeah. cups and things okay? I will always pick a by weight over a by cup. Okay. Because you could go to, you could go to the dollar store, you could go to a fancy kitchen store, and one company's cup is like this, and then another company's cup only fills up to that much of that company's cup. By weight, there's like an actual kilo or a pound somewhere that zeroes out all the weights everywhere. Um, it's not the same with a cup or a tablespoon or anything like that. So like you have a scale, zero yep. it, and then measure the cup? So you have so your scale. Yeah, so if a recipe this is doesn't my scale. Grams. I've got my scale. I'm going to put my bowl on top. Yeah. My zero bowl it. weighs something. Then I zero out that bowl. So then I'm measuring my flour and my egg. Well, you won't weight an egg. An egg is an egg. Um, but my flour and my chocolate chips and stuff like that, if you're using small amounts, they'll still generally say like a tablespoon or a teaspoon sometimes, or they'll use like four grams. Don't get confident <laughs> and just be like, this looks like four grams, splat. Especially if there's already stuff in there, because how are you going to take out what you already put in? So it may seem like it's taking forever. Drizzle it in. Watch that scale. Canadian Tire has, I think it's Starfrit for like 12 bucks. Um, you're going to start weighing everything, too. It becomes addicting. Like, oh, how much is and this? And do you convert? <laughs> like, if a recipe says one cup, three cups, then you go and convert online how many grams that is? You can. Um, 
the times that I've done that is when I know like, oh, the weight of this is one cup already okay. in my head. Um, that's a hard, a hard one. Because again, like some people write these recipes and they are actually using that one cup. Okay. Yep. But they don't weigh it because that's the cup that they always use so it works. And it generally works. Um, but there are, and I found it, that there's mismatch in the weights and what's actually there, um, which again, when you start slow, you can start to see it build in front of you and you'll get used to it. Thank you so much. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> oh, no, you haven't gotten yours yet. Oh, okay. There's one more, I think, coming. Any other questions at all? doesn't have to be about bread, it can be about regular baking. I can try and answer it. <laughs> I'm a jack of all trades. We have a question over here. What's the best way to warm this up tomorrow when I want to serve it? 425 in your oven, just a couple minutes. Don't put it in for like five minutes because then it's baking it even further. Just a couple minutes until it's nice and warm. I mean, you could use a microwave. I've microwaved pizza, but it becomes like a soggy mess. Just use your oven. <laughs> you're, you're waiting for yours. <laughs> Pardon? Oh, no. <laughs> I think they've got pizza boxes for you guys, too, to take them home, if there is any left. <laughs> I think you're going to frame yours. Oh, you've eaten it. They didn't drop it. <laughs> no. I think it's all right. It's my first time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you. So I'll introduce myself because I never introduced myself before. I'm the one at the back asking all the questions because I don't actually bake or cook. Um, my name's Lydia DiFrancesco. I'm the co-chair of the board of directors for Italian Week Ottawa. So I really want to thank you all for coming tonight. Huge thank you to Rebecca for doing this amazing presentation. <laughs> So I have a, a question for you guys. Did you have a good time tonight? Yes. I know there's still some of you waiting. Like Todd said, it's just going to be one more minute. Um, but some of the ones that I've seen look so good. And the bread is just delicious. I have a few thank yous and shout outs uh, to give. I do want to let you know that um, in case you want to go back and watch the replay, it is available on YouTube. So you can find it there. I'll send you guys the link. Uh, we'll also be sending you a link to fill out a survey, so please fill out the survey so we can know uh, what you liked and how to improve for next year. We also want to thank Sala San Marco for this wonderful venue and for allowing us to use the kitchen and their ovens so that we could bake all this focaccia for you. And a huge thank you to Extreme Pizza, great pizza shop, shop just up the street on Preston. Uh, they were able to provide us the pizza boxes that you can have um, to bring your focaccia home tonight. So huge thank you to them. And we will have, if you want, you can stay and chat with Rebecca afterwards. And if you want to get your photo taken with her, we can do that as well. And I want to let you know, uh, for those of you who didn't buy the bundle uh, and you haven't purchased a ticket for the Wine Masterclass, in-person tickets are sold out, but you're absolutely uh, able to watch it online on our YouTube channel, it's going to be on Thursday, 7 p.m., and it's with a sommelier named Véronique Rivet. She owns Soif Baravin in Gatineau, and she is a world-winning sommelier. It's going to be a great, great event, even if you're not in person trying the wines yourself. And I think the last thing I wanted to mention uh, was to invite you to come to our grand finale weekend, which is taking place here on Preston, this Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. It's a three-day event, street party, lots of things happening along the street. We have our main stage at 301 Preston Street where we have performers, bands, DJs,
comedy starting on Friday night, all day Saturday, all day Sunday. And for those of you who have children, we also have a kids zone located at Plouffe Park, which is just at Preston and Somerset. So we'll have kids rides and face painting and all sorts of fun stuff for them. Uh, all the details are on our website, italianweekottawa.ca. So you can find out all the information there or you can ask me or any of the volunteers in the blue shirts. Thank you so much for coming tonight. The last focaccia is coming out. Hope you guys had a great evening. Buonasera, grazie.